reading to the Bible in one year, September 5th, 1 Samuel chapters 29 through 30, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Ezekiel 8, and Psalms 46 through 47. The Philistines brought all their military units together at Aphek, while Israel was camped by the spring in Jezreel. As the Philistine leaders were passing in review with their uh, units of hundreds and thousands, David and his men were passing in review behind them with Achish. When the Philistines' commanders asked, why are these Hebrews doing, what are they doing here? Achish answered the Philistine commanders, that that is David, servant of King Saul of Israel. He has been with me a considerable period of time. Uh, from the day he defected until today, I found no fault with him. The Philistine commanders, however, were enraged at Achish and told him, send that man back and let him return to the place you assigned him. He must not go down with us into battle today, uh, only to become our adversary during the battle. What better way would he be able to ingratiate himself with his master than with the heads of our men? Isn't this the David they sing about during their dances? Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands? So Achish summoned David and told him, As the Lord lives, you are an honorable, an honorable man. I think it is good to have you fighting in this unit with me, but because I, sorry, because I have found no fault in you from the day you came to me until today. But the leaders don't think you are reliable. Now, Go back quietly, and you won't be doing anything uh, the Philistine leaders think is wrong. But what, what have I done? David replied to Achish. From the first day I entered your service until today, uh, what have you found against your servant to keep me from going to fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Achish answered David, I'm convinced that you are as reliable as an angel of God. But the Philistine commanders have said he must not go with us into battle. So, get up early in the morning. You and your master's servants who came with you, uh, when you've gotten up early, go as soon as it is light. So David and his men got up early uh, in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. David and his men arrived in Ziklag on the third day. The Amalekites had raided the Negev and attacked and burned Ziklag, his city. They also had kidnapped the women and everyone in front, rather, everyone in it, from the youngest to the eldest. They had killed no one but had carried them off as they went along their way. When David and his men arrived at the town, they found it burned. Their wives, sons, and daughters had been kidnapped. David and, his, and the troops with them wept loudly until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelite and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had also been kidnapped. David was in an extremely difficult position because the troops uh, talked about stoning him, for they were all very bitter over the loss of their sons and daughters. But David found strength in Yahweh his God. David said to the priest Abiathar, son of, Ab of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought it to him. And David asked Yahweh, Should I pursue these raiders? Will I overtake them? And the Lord, through the Urim and Thummim, uh, replied to him, Pursue them, for you will certainly overtake them and rescue the people. So David sent, rather David and the six hundred men with him went. They came to Wadi Basor, uh, where some stayed behind. David uh, and four hundred of the men continued in pursuit, while two hundred stopped because they were too exhausted to cross the Wadi Basor. David's men found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David. They gave him some bread to eat and water to drink, and then they gave him some pressed figs and two clusters of raisins. After he ate, he revived, for he hadn't eaten food or drunk water for three days or three nights, or and three nights. And David said to him, Who do you belong to? Where are you from? I am an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite man, he said. My master abandoned me when I got sick three days ago. 
We raided the country, sorry, the south country of the Carathites, the territory of Judah, and the south country of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. David then asked him, Will you lead me to these raiders? He said, Swear to me by God that you won't kill me or turn me over to my master, and I will lead you to them. So he led him, and there were the Amalekites spread out over the entire area, eating, drinking, and celebrating because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and the land of Judah. David slaughtered them from twilight until the evening of the next day. None of them escaped, except 400 young men who got on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken. He also rescued his two wives. Nothing of theirs was missing from the youngest to the eldest including the sons and daughters, and all the plunder that the Amalekites had taken. David got everything back. He took all the livestock and herds, uh, which were driven ahead, of the li rather, driven ahead of the other livestock, and the people shouted, This is David's plunder. When David came to the two hundred men who had been too exhausted to go with him, and had been left at the Wadi Basor, they came out to meet him and to the troops with him. When David approached the men, he greeted them, but all the corrupt and worthless men among those who had gone with David argued, Because they didn't go with us, we will not give them any of the plunder we recovered uh, to them except for each man's wife and children. They may take it and go. But David said, My, my brothers, you must not do this with what the Lord has given us. He protected us and handed over to us the, the raiders who came against us. Who can agree to your proposal? The share of the one who goes into battle is the same as the share of the one who remains with the supplies. They will share equally. And it has been so from that day forward. David established this policy as a law and an ordinance for Israel, and it still continues to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, here is a gift for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. He sent gifts to those in Bethel, in Ramoth of the, Ge of the Negev, and in Jatir, to those in Aurora and Sifmoth, and, to Esh and in Eshtemoa, to those in Rachel, in the towns of the Jeremielites, and in the towns of the Kenites, to those in, in Horma, in uh, Bor Ashan, and in Atak, and to those with Heber to those in Hebron, sorry, and also to those in the places where David and his men had roamed. And that is all of the notes to there. Let's move on to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 now. Paul now continues. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. If you haven't read through scripture before, this might be new to you. But in the, um, in the account of the Exodus, when the people left underneath, um, uh, under the threat from the... Um, the Egyptian people, after all of the plagues and after every every house had their firstborn killed, after all the firstborn cattle were killed, everything was killed. It, it was a really bad time. Um, they finally cast them out. They didn't just allow them to leave. They said, get out of our prop sorry, property, get out of our land, just get entirely out, go away. From that moment on, the Lord was a shield for the people. He was a cloud covering them during the day to keep them safe. He was also a cloud of protection. When the Egyptians showed up where the people had been hemmed in at the Red Sea, the Lord was a wall of cloud with lightning to separate the Egyptian army from the people. Then the Lord opened up the Red Sea for the people so they could walk through the Red Sea on dry land. And again, I've heard it said that 
Well, it was literally just a little marsh that they were walking through. Uh, Red Sea just means the Reed Sea, and they were just walking around the edge of it. That's all it was. It wasn't a miracle. Miracles don't happen. The Lord says that there were walls of water on either side. And that they walked through these walls of water. Sounds like a miracle to me. And God allowed the people to pass through the water, right? And as they were passing through this water, what, what do we learn about this? That God is the one who did this for them, to protect them, to keep them safe. Once again, just as God did the same thing, hemming the people in and keeping them safe during the great flood. Another miracle that God had done to save his elect people. Here also, the elect people, Israel, are being cast out of the land and God hems them in and protects them as they go through the Red Sea. Meanwhile, there's a wall of, of cloud and lightning keeping the people or keeping the, their, their enemies away from them. And once they've gotten far enough through, God allows the, um, their, their enemies, the Egyptian army, to come after them, and they're chasing after them with their chariots. And once they get to the middle, the part, the dry land that the people had just walked through, right, probably had taken carts through as well, now suddenly the ground's getting wet and the chariot wheels are getting stuck and they can't get through. They get about halfway in, and God closes the water again. These walls of water on either side of the people, he closes them in. And all the Egyptian army drowns. Again, kind of a weird thing if it's just a little reed marsh they're walking around. And this is what happens. All of them are dead. This is God doing this for the people. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. See how this works? They all ate the same spiritual food. They were given a food from God every single day in what is called manna. Now, manna isn't a, a, a name brand of something. The term in Hebrew literally means, I have no idea what this is. I said it was some sort of um, thing like a coriander seed that would just appear on the ground and they would go out and they would pluck it up. It would only be good for that day or if it's the, the day before a, a Sabbath, now, it would last for two days and they could collect twice as much. But anything that they carried and held on to for the next day after that, it would rot. And they'd have worms in it. It would be super gross. Nobody could eat it. So God was giving them what they needed for each individual day. So they would learn to trust in him, to have faith that he's going to carry all of their needs. He's their protector. He's their deliverer. Right? He's their redeemer. And he's also the one who's providing for them. He's their provider. This is the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. They were going through a desert. There was no water anywhere. The people would constantly complain. They would come up to a, a, a body of water and it would be bitter, meaning that it was uh, it had death in the water. It was um, the, the people were getting sick from drinking it. So God would keep the water so he would make the water fresh for them so they could drink it. Or they would have, uh, they would be in a desert region with nothing there at all. And God commanded, go and strike this rock and I will stand invisibly in front of the rock and you will strike the rock, striking God, and then out of him would flow the, the living water through him so that all the people could drink. See how the illusions here are working between uh, what happened in the Old Testament and those things that Jesus did, right? And this is exactly what we're seeing here. And this is the point that he's making. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Jesus the Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. This goes back to what we read in, in Romans. Remember? 
since they were all struck down in the wilderness. Every, again, if you haven't read through this with me or read through it on your own, um, no adult who came out of Egypt survived except for two people, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, the, Jef uh, the son of Jephunneh, I think? Reasonably certain that's it. Anyway, and Caleb. These are the only two people. Why did they survive? They were part of the 12 spies who went over into the land to go and, and spy it out for the people because the people were terrified. They're like, well, we don't know what's in this land. We hear that there's, there's giants there. What are we going to do? So they picked uh, one person from each tribe and all of them so that they would have someone that they would trust, you see. And then these 12 people went over into the land and they spied it out and they went all over Canaan. And they came back and gave the report. And they said, there's giants, there's walled cities, there's armies, there's, uh, but, but, but there's also all of this great food and all of this great pasture land and all of these great sources of water and everything we could possibly desire. But 10 of the people twisted this, this great report of the land to only focus on the negatives and got the people uh, trying to be trying to run back to Egypt because they were so afraid. Again, they still didn't trust in God, despite all the things that God had done to, to reveal his ability to take care of them. Again, every single day, there was this cloud over their heads to stop them from getting scorched. Their sandals never wore out. Their clothing never wore out. So God said, fine. You don't want to, you know what? That's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, for the same number of days that those guys were spying out the land, 38, um, you're going to walk around for each day they were gone. You're going to walk around for a year in this wilderness. And not one of you who is over the age of 20 will survive. Your bones will not make it into the promised land. This is what's going to happen to you. You're all going to die here in the wilderness. Because the people were saying, oh, well, God is doing this so that our children will be destroyed. See how they're trying to twist the hearts of the people against, against Moses and against God? This is the same thing. The people were terrified of that. And so that's what we see here. God was not pleased with most of them. Only the children and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, 99.9% .9 certain that's the name, and Joshua, son of Nun. Not even Moses made it in because he also sinned against God in a flagrant way because he acted as if he was God. It was a, a point of, of, of frustration, but God will not be mocked. And so not even Moses made it into the promised land. So what do we have? God was not pleased with most of the people. They were all his, his people, right? They were all descendants of Abraham. But why didn't all of them make it into the promised land? Because they did not have faith. Now, these things took place as an example for us. Paul continues, so that we will not desire evil things as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to party. Or a better translation of the word party is play. They got into sensual things, orgies and the like. And they were doing this, these, these terrible, wicked things in worship of these false gods that they created for themselves, even under God's protection, even after God had delivered them numerous times. Verse 8, let's not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. In a single, 20, sorry, in a single day, 23,000 people died. Let us not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. And don't grumble as some of them did and they were killed by the destroyer. Verse 
They chase after idolatry. They chase after sexual immorality. They tested God and they grumbled against the things that God had given them. Verse 11, these things were given to them as examples. Sorry, these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our instruction. That's why we know about them today. On whom the ends of the ages has come. It has come upon us. So whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. All of these people thought that they were the people of God simply because they were genetic descendants from Abraham. Almost all of them died. The numbers are staggering. If you look at the number of people who, who first came out, and then the children who finally went into the promised land, about two and a half million people died in the wilderness. No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity, common to man. But God is faithful. You are not faithful. I'm not faithful. That humanity is not faithful to God. It's kind of the one thing we're good at is being faithful to ourselves and not God. But God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the, temp with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you will be able to bear this temptation. So then, my, my, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I'm speaking to sense, as, sorry, as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I am saying. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. Since all of us share the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? What am I saying then? That food sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol itself is anything? No. But I do say that what they sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the, 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 the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot share in the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or are we provoking the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Again, quoting uh, common quotes for the people. Um, everything is permissible for them. This was a common term in Corinth. Everything is permissible. But not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. No one is to seek his own good, but the good of the other person. Eat everything that is sold in the meat market without raising questions for the sake of conscience. He's giving them an example now. Uh, since the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, everything that's in it. Now I have some friends who are uh, dispensational. And they believe that um, when Jesus returns, they will reign with him for an exact thousand years because the thousand years shown in, in, in Revelation is an exact number of 1,000. And uh, from their estimation, then also the text only ever means a thousand whenever you see it. If it's a number given like that, it only ever means 1,000. Yet in Psalms, we read that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So does that mean that there's only a thousand very specific hills on the entire planet? Where God owns those cattle? And the rest are owned by, I don't know, Sam the Butcher? Or is it perhaps that the entire earth belongs to God because he created it? And the term thousand used in this case is merely something to, to show us a very large number. It's a symbolic number to tell us of a very large number. God will reign for a very large number of years. 
one that will never, ever end. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Every piece of meat and every animal belongs already to God. Idols are nothing. We all agree with these things. So this is why he's saying, eat everything that is sold in the meat market without raising questions for the sake of conscience. Why for the sake of conscience? Think about your own conscience. If you're worried about eating meat sacrificed to idols, right? If you don't know if the meat was sacrificed to an idol, and you go up and you just buy it and you take it home and you grill it up and you eat it, maybe a nice ribeye, right? If you don't know who it's, um, sorry, who it was sacrificed to, well, then your conscience is clear. Meat's meat. Everything belongs to God, and we give thanks to God for the ability to eat this meat. But if someone says to you, this food is from a sacrifice, well, now you can't eat it. So out of consideration for the one who told you, and for the sake of conscience, your own conscience, you can't, it's not your own conscience, sorry, um, for the sake of conscience. He goes into the next line here and he says, I do not mean for your own conscience, because again, we understand that the entire earth belongs to God. All the animals on the earth belong to God, the true God, the God of all creation, our God. We also know that what they're worshiping isn't a real thing. So when they sacrifice to it, it's not that big of a deal, but for the sake of the other person's conscience. They might be a friend who's a, maybe their conscience is is worried about it. And they're like, oh, that, that, that was sacrificed to, to whatever. Now you know that because of their conscience, you probably shouldn't eat it. Because you might be leading them to violate their own conscience. And therefore leading them to sin. Or perhaps they're not like that. Maybe they're just letting you know, oh, this was sacrificed to so-and-so. If you eat this, you're going to become, you're going to live a long time or be, you know, virile or have a great head of hair. I don't know. And so because of that, this is another type of, so for their sake, because again, you don't believe in any of that, then you probably shouldn't eat the meat either. See how this works? This is why he says, I do not mean your own conscience, but the other person. For why is my freedom judged by another person's conscience? If I participate with thanksgiving, why am I criticized because of something for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do everything to the glory of God or for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or the church of God. Just as I also try to please everyone in everything, not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of many, so that they may be saved. Imitate me, as I also imitate Christ. Let's go on to Ezekiel chapter 8 now. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, I was sitting in my house, and the elders of Judah were sitting in front of me. And there was the hand of the Lord God, as rather, and there the hand of the Lord God came down on me. And I looked, and there was someone who looked like a man. From what seemed to be his waist down was fire, and from his waist up was something that looked bright, like the gleam of amber. He stretched out what appeared to be a hand and took me by the hair of my head. Then the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and carried me in a vision, rather carried me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the inner gate that faces north, where the offensive statue that provokes jealousy was located. I saw the glory of the God of Israel there, like the vision I had seen in the plain. The Lord said to me, Son of man, look toward the north. I looked to the north, and there was this offensive statue north of the altar gate at the entrance. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing here? 
more detestable acts than that, sorry, that the house of Israel is committing so that I must depart from my sanctuary? You will see even more detestable acts. Then he brought me to the entrance of the court. And when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. And he said to me, son of man, dig through the wall. So I dug through the wall and discovered a doorway. And he said to me, go in and see the de de detestable, wicked acts they are committing here. I went in and looked. And there, engraved all around the wall, was every kind of abhorrent thing. Crawling creatures and beasts, as well as all the idols of the house of Israel. Seventy elders from the house of Israel were standing before them, with Je uh, Jezaniah, a son of Shaphan, standing among them. Each had a fire pan in his hand, and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising up. They're sacrificing or, or, or putting incense before all of these detestable idols and images. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his idol? For they are saying, The Lord doesn't see us. The Lord has abandoned the land. Again, he said to me, You will see even more detestable acts that they are committing. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the Lord's house, and I saw women sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Uh, Tammuz, at the time of Ezekiel, uh, is a Babylonian god, uh, Dumuzi, is worshipped as both a fertility god and the lord of the underworld. Rites used in worship of Tammuz are tied to the annual cycles of death and rebirth of vegetation. When plants uh, wither under the heat of the summer sun, Tammuz is thought to have died and descended to the underworld. Mourning rites mark his passing. The reappearance of vegetation is viewed as the return of Tammuz. Fertility rites seek to ensure the productivity of the land. Ritual lamentation for a dead idol has now been substituted for the worship of the true and living God. This is the point being made here in verse 14. Verse 15, And he said to me, Do you see this, son of man? You will see even more detestable acts than these. So he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house. And there were about 25 men at the entrance of the Lord's temple between the portico, the portico or the porch and the altar with their backs to the Lord's temple and their faces turned to the east. And they were bowing to the east in worship of the sun. And he said to me, do you see this son of man? Is it not enough for the house of Judah to commit these detestable acts that they are doing here? that they must also fill the land with violence and repeatedly anger me, even putting the branch to their nose. Therefore, I will respond with wrath. I will not show pity or spare them. Though they call loudly in my hearing, I will not listen to them. And now let's conclude with Psalms 46 through 47. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth trembles and mountains topple into the depths of the seas, though its waters roar and foam and the, the mountains quake with its turmoil, there is a river. Its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. Nations rage. Kingdoms topple. The earth melts when he lifts his voice. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come. Come. See the works of the Lord who brings devastation on the earth. He makes wars cease throughout the earth. He shatters bow and cuts spears to pieces. He sets wagons ablaze. Stop fighting and know that I am God. Exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. The Lord of armies, the God of hosts is with us. 
the God of Jacob, is our stronghold. Now Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a jubilant cry. For the Lord, Yahweh, the Most High, is awe-inspiring. A great king over the whole earth. He subdues peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chooses for our, rather he chooses for us our inheritance, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God ascends among shouts of joy. The Lord, with the sound of a ram's horn, sing praise to God. Sing praise. Sing praise to our King. Sing praise. Sing a song of wisdom, for God is King of the whole earth. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the peoples have assembled uh, with the, the people of the God of Abraham. For the leaders of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. All right, and that is all for today. So God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.